Hi, welcome to Fostering Resilience. My name is KJ Foster. In today's video, I'm sharing with you an interview that I just conducted, so it's pretty late at night here, that's why it's really dark, um, that I just conducted via Zoom with a woman named Deb. And Deb shares with us her experience being addicted to alcohol and her successful recovery. It's a part of my No Shame campaign, Choosing to Live Your Recovery Out Loud. So if you're brand new to my channel, my channel is dedicated to producing videos that help people who are part of the recovering community. So whether you're struggling to get sober, whether you're already on the journey, on the path, whether you're recovered, whether you're the family member, whoever you are, my videos are all about helping people to recover. So if you are new after the video, this video, you may want to hop on over to my channel and check out my other videos and see if there's something else that you may find beneficial. But right now, let's get to my interview with Deb. So we have Deb here who is going to share her recovery story with us. And I just want to first say thank you so much, Deb, for being with us today and for being willing to be on my YouTube channel to share your story. So we're just gonna go ahead and, and get right to it. I have some questions that I'd like to, to ask you. And the first being just to start out by telling us a little bit about yourself, you know, where you live, what do you do? Are you in a relationship? And basically the, just the basics of who you are today. Okay, sure, sure, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for asking me to, for inviting me to come. Um, my name is Deb, as you said, and I um, live in Minnesota. I am not in a relationship, but I do have two thriving, healthy adult children. And I guess um, the basics of who I am today, I am very blessed and very thankful. And tell us what your, what your addiction issue was and, and basically just the, the background of how, you know, how that progressed, how you came about being addicted? Sure. Um, well, I had, I had um, probably three addictions, codependency, um, food, and alcohol, but alcohol was the one that did the most damage mm -hmm. in my life. Um, how did I get to the point? Well, I think I was addicted from the first time I drank. I was 17, a senior in high school. I um, went to my first party and I drank so much that I, I got very ill, um, but, it fe but the effects of it were wonderful. I, I didn't like the taste of it. Um, it was kegger beer, but I liked how it made me feel. And um, I think the next, the next time I drank, um, I was 18 graduated from high school, and that was my first blackout. Only at the time, I didn't know, know it was a blackout. But again, I just remember before the blackout how great I felt. Um, for me, as someone that was addicted to alcohol, I didn't, I didn't know I was addicted. I just knew I didn't like who I was, and I had so much pain, and I just wanted to escape, to run away. Um, growing up, school and church, I think, were my escape. But once I graduated high school, um, alcohol became my escape. And so I think I was addicted from the get-go, even though I didn't realize it at the time. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Did Tell, tell us about when you realized that you were addicted. Like, when did you, what was the, what was the turning point, the defining moment? What happened? And when was that? Yeah, well, probably I had, oh boy. Um, I don't think I realized, I always thought I could be, I could have a problem with alcohol. Um, I never felt that I was truly addicted to alcohol till I was 42 years old of age. And I hit my um, last, my third and final bottom, which was more devastating to me than anything that had happened up to that point in my life. And that was when I realized that um, at the time my children were uh, teenagers and I realized that my drinking was hurting 
not only me, but it was hurting them. And I didn't realize that until um, the next morning after a blackout and my children helped me piece together. And I was an angry, mean, drunk. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't physically beat them, but my words mm -hmm. hurt m more than a physical hurt would have. And it was at that point that I knew I, I had to, I had to change. I had to, I had to, and I had tried to stop drinking over the years um, on my own, but it wasn't until that defining moment, 42 years of age, when I realized I had turned into the very parent, I swore to God I'd never become. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can identify with that because my, um, my husband, that's very similar to his story. He, um, he, his father was alcoholic and he remembers a very defining moment where, you know, he swore when he grew up because he grew up with an alcoholic father that, yeah. you know, he would never become like his father. He was never like he did everything in his power to become exact, yeah. do the exact opposite. And, and yeah, then that true. defining moment where he stood there and he realized he had, he had become his father. And so that, yeah that was uh, similar to his experience as well. So was that then, what did you do? How did you go about um, getting sober? Was that the defining moment where you decided to take action and you decided to do something to, to get sober? Oh, yes, yes. And I should probably back up a little bit. In my 20s, I had um, tried to stop drinking and I stopped for 10 years. Um, and then um, my beautiful children were born over the course of that, those 10 years. And then I um, um, filed for, I divorced their father and um, I started drinking right after that. So the second time um, I was in a car accident, I was driving drunk. Thank God no one was in the car. No one was on the street. No one was injured, but I almost died. I was driving up a mountain and my car fishtailed. It was in the rain and the road was slippery and it hit the bank and then hit the other side. And the only thing that kept me from going over the cliff was a guardrail. Wow. And so that's when I decided um, with the help of others that um, I should probably, I should probably do something. So I, I decided to go to treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I had also, just gotten my master's degree. And I raced to the 12 steps like it was a homework assignment and I got straight A's. Mm -hmm. And I decided I was smarter than everybody. I didn't, I didn't need to, so I, I stopped going. So the final time then, I went when I was 42 and my, what was my bottom mm -hmm. was um, this time, whereas before I'd always look for evidence or proof that I wasn't like, Mm -hmm. Everybody else, I was either too young and they were too old, or I was smarter than them, or I could do it on my own, or I was stronger. This time I realized I needed to look for the similarities. So um, I, I started, you know, I, I started going to meetings right away and I started, I did the 12 steps and this time I did the steps more than once. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it, it became, um, for me, it became... a very healing journey and, and it still is. Mm -hmm. But does that answer your question? I don't yeah, know if I went yes, off. Yes, absolutely. And I totally identify with that because my first several times making an <laughs> attempt, you know, to um, participate in the 12 step program in, in AA, I had very similar experiences where um, at least I, I, my perceptions were very similar in that I was constantly comparing myself out. I was constantly looking for those things that made me not qualify, you know, rather than, you know, looking for those similarities. And it wasn't yeah. until this last time that I started to look for the similarities and not all of the, the differences. And wow, there's a lot of, especially when you think about when you focus on the emotions yeah, as opposed exactly. to the experiences because yeah. one of my issues was that nobody seemed to have the same experience that I had. Um, 
And, and so that was always my go-to, you know, I'm not like, because nobody's mm -hmm. really had my experience. And yeah. ultimately I found some people who have had my experience, but that keeps that, you know, can really keep us stuck and blocked from, from, from getting it. So what were, um, Deb, what were some of the challenges that you faced? You know, you, you, you already shared with us the fact that you had a couple of bottoms, right? You had a, which I um, interpret as, as you, several attempts, right? Some oh, yeah. attempts at, yeah. at getting and staying sober. Um, so some relapses right. along the way. What would you, what would you say were some of like the main challenges aside from the one that you've already mentioned, which is pretty obvious of, you know, not looking, comparing out, so to speak, not really looking for, looking for ways in which you were different as opposed to, you know, the same, but what were some of the other, were there other challenges that, that you believe contributed to you relapsing other than that? I think the main reason I relapsed is that I tried to do it on my own. I was convinced I wasn't like those people in recovery. And I thought I was strong enough, um, smart enough, that I independent enough that I could do it on my own. Um, because And then when I would stop, and then when I stopped um, including other people in recovery in my life, then um, all the icky stuff came back, you know, the stuff that had, had made me want to escape in the first place, you know, the, the, um, the self-loathing and the self-hatred and the challenges and just life. Oh my God. <laughs> Single parent of two full-time career. I mean, I, I had no supports. I was all alone <laughs> and it's just, it was so much. And, um, yeah, I think, I think that was probably the, the main ones. Yeah. I can relate to all of that. So would you, would you say that because our, our um, experiences are at least those being, you know, divorce, single mother of two, you know, teenagers at, you know, young to teenager at the time, definitely added to the escalation of, of my drinking, the, the fear, you know, um, of being a single mom and the struggle and all, just all that comes with that. Um, is really difficult. And so turning to, to alcohol was, was definitely a, a contrib contributing factor for me. Do you, do you feel, do you believe that, you know, my, one of my theories, so to speak, is that, you know, there are some critical elements to being able to recover. And especially, you know, not just abstinence, right? Not just, you know, right. not drinking but to really recovering and not having that self-loathing and that self-hatred and thriving and living a good, you know, happy life that you really need the guidance of like a mentor to run your thinking by and to help you to, you know, go from that place, get out of the swamp, so to speak, as I put it, you yeah. know, help pull you out of the swamp and that, you know, we need a, you know, a, a support group um, to surround us and to love us and to, nurture us and help to strengthen us, you know, um, through the recovery process and that we need, you know, what, what, um, what I call, you know, spirituality, my version of spirituality, you know, that it's different. It's very personal to each individual person, but I think spirituality relative to mindset, like going from a place of shame, anger, despair, um, hopelessness to being able to rise up into hope, courage, faith, you know, forgiveness. Um, so do you think that, that, uh, how do you feel about that? Do you think that that's been an essential part of your recovery process? Oh, absolutely. Yes. You know, <laughs> I remember when I stopped drinking, I thought all my problems were going to go away. <laughs> 
they didn't. <laughs> they were there in full color. And, you know, I was there. And, um, you know, having that support group, uh, being surrounded by those healthy friendships, um, doing the 12 steps, practicing the 12 steps, um, absolutely changed. And something else that just popped in my head, I don't know if it's relevant, but you mentioned faith. What changed for me was my God. Before I, before I so, sobered up and, and actually recovered and, and got healthy, I thought my God was an angry, vindictive, punishing, angry, angry parent figure. You know, like I, you know, I was raised by two parents like that. And when I started becoming healthy, I realized that no, God is a loving, my God is a loving, caring, nurturing parent figure, unconditional love, wants me to be happy. You know, all these qualities that I learned as I, once I became a mother to my own two children, children. And so, um, you know, and then there were other things along the way too. Um, I had, I had been diagnosed with PTSD. I'm a survivor of both childhood and domestic abuse. And so um, I also had the courage then to get other, to get help and get treated for my PTSD. So um, it was just a, a full picture, you know, I, taking care of myself, eating properly, um, feeding my spirit, all of it, all of it was, it was so much more than just not picking up a drink. So I really identify with that, the whole concept of, you know, I'm just going to put down the drink. I just need to stop drinking. Like, I don't need to do these steps. I don't need to do anything else. Like, I'll just stop drinking for a period of time. And you know, and for me, it was, I was on probation. So it was like, oh, I'll just stop drinking until I'm off probation and then I'll be fine. And, and that all my problems will, you know, just go away. I had no idea how sick I was into Cause it's all like in retrospect, right? So you start to get, as you, as the mental illness starts to get better and he, you start to heal your brain because it's your brain and it's affected as the brain heals in retrospect, I was able to look back and then start to see and go, Oh my God, like I was out of my mind and I had absolutely no clue that I was out of my mind. Another thing is that I had no idea until I was even several years sober as to the impact of shame, like how shame influenced not only my progression, but my relapses. Was that something that you feel um, impacted you in any way? Do you, do you believe shame played a part? Oh, absolutely. I was raised and controlled by shame and I was so full of shame. And I mean, I was ashamed of being alive. I was ashamed of breathing. I was ashamed of taking up too much space. I was ashamed of saying the wrong thing or not saying the right thing or doing the wrong thing or not. I mean, it was just, I was constantly beating myself up and shaming myself. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the dis part of what kept me drinking was to escape from that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I can relate to that as well. And I hear it from so many people. That's why I ask because I, you know, I've done some, you know, not extensive research, but some preliminary research on shame that that shows just how, how it's tied into how correlated it is with relapse risk. And you know, once I started to learn about it when I was about two years sober, it was, it was so eye-opening for me in terms of how much of an impact it, it has had on, on the progression, like I said, and the, the maintenance, you know, the, the relapsing over and over and over again. So I like to ask it as a part of my questions to everybody, because I'm interested in, you know, it's sort of like a little bit of research study, you know, because I'm doing these interviews. Um, you're one of my first interviews. So I'm interviewing, you know, multiple people to hopefully, you know, be able to create this this library of, 
you know, stories and also as sort of like a research project of getting information about what, what your challenges have been is shame. Um, has shame been an impact? What are some of your, my next question, what are some of your sober disciplines? Do you have sober disciplines that you do on a daily basis that you believe help to not only maintain your recovery, but help you to continue to grow and change? Oh my goodness. Yes. I, um, I have several, I, I refer to them as my tools. It's like, I have this little tool belt I wear around my waist and I have all these tools in them. Mm -hmm. And you know, some of the things I do daily or on a regular basis that maintains my healthy recovery is I meditate, I journal, I pray. Um, I practice the 12 steps, you know, um, I, I say the serenity prayer in the morning and I thank God for another day of sobriety and abstinence that night. Um, I also, you know, take care of myself. I, I get enough sleep and I make healthy food choices and I exercise on a daily basis. Um, I am, um, oh, the most, oh, the most important one, which was instrumental in me um, relapsing was I go to I go to regular meetings uh, that are about the solution because mm -hmm. um, I, I never want to forget where I came from or how mm -hmm. horrible it was. Mm -hmm. And um, I have, you know, I have healthy friendships from, from mm -hmm. those, those meetings. Right. Okay. So you mentioned that one of the most important ones for you is um, meetings, you know, connecting with, with other people in recovery. Are there any others that you would, um, that you would identify as critical to your recovery? Yeah, absolutely. Um, turning it over to God, prayer, trusting him, faith, having faith that no matter, I'm going to be okay no matter what. Mm -hmm. And then probably the other one I use that I, I, I just remembered is um, I use HALT. So when I'm feeling in a, I'm in a funk, mm -hmm. you know, I'll pray. I'll ask God, you know, to remove whatever it is. But I'll also, if I, I'll also look at, am I hungry? You know, if I am, I'll get a snack. Am I angry? If I am, I'll, I'll, I'll call somebody or I'll pray. I'll ask God to help me remove that resentment and replace it with, you know, acceptance or I'll pray to bless that person. Um, lonely. If I'm lonely, I'll call someone. If I'm tired, I'll go to bed an hour earlier so I get eight hours of sleep. So that just goes kind of with that whole taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. So what would you say has been the most challenging part of you um, getting sober and or uh, staying sober? <laughs> I still laugh at myself because when I, I thought that life was going to be just easy and smooth sailing once I stopped drinking. So I already talked about that. But I think the other thing was, um, what well, probably ties with that. I still had to, I still had life. I still had to deal with my, with life and, and the ups and downs. And, um, man, that was hard. And I think the biggest thing was, um, when I first sobered up the people that I love that are closest to me, they, they rebelled a lot. They didn't, necessarily appreciate like want this new person in their life mm -hmm. um so it was a daily in the beginning it was a daily battle i had to stay in the moment i had to um it was hard it was really hard i just i think it was those the expectation that if I stopped drinking, everything would be peachy keen and, and it not being that way was really um, a very rude awakening for me. Yeah, I think that, you know, um, in 12 step recovery, um, there's something that is referred to as a pink cloud. And that's yeah. when somebody gets sober and life is wonderful, you know, and, and they're never, ever, ever, ever going to drink again, you know, and um, people will say, and that happened, my very first experience was like that. And people would say, you're going to fall off that pink cloud, you're going to fall off that pink cloud, and you better watch out when you fall off. And, and now looking back on that, I understand what that means in terms of, you know, 
getting sober is not easy for most, for most people. And most people experience life being more challenging before they experience life really getting better. Right. In my, in my case, it took, you know, 12 to 14 months before it started to get better, if not longer. And I remember when I used to share that in meetings and people would say, oh, you're going to scare away the newcomer. Don't tell them that. And I'm like, well, I got to tell them the truth. You know what I mean? Like your life may not get better right away, but it's going to get better. Like that's the whole thing is that I think people don't recognize um, and you know, just how long it takes to truly recover, that there's such a significant rehabilitation period and to be really cautious if right away from the get go, you're like, you know, you know, rah, rah, rah with the pom poms going, whoa, yay, sobriety. This is great that there's going to be a debt, you know, like that's only going to last so long before, you know, you get to the point where it's like, you have to look at yourself and start to change. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, thank you for sharing that because I think that that is definitely a common experience from people who've achieved long-term recovery is that it's not an easy process, you know, and if it were easy, everybody would get sober. <laughs> everybody. Yeah, I, have to, I have to add, it took me years <laughs> to take me a few months. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And that's okay. It, you, but you, you know, you got there eventually. Yeah. So that's, yeah. you know, that's what matters is that we all will get there eventually where life starts to become effortless you know, and you can handle things, you know, that used to baffle, you know, handle things that used to baffle all those things, you know, start to start to materialize and start to happen. But it's this, you know, we want it so fast, we want it to happen like quickly, and it just does not happen quickly at all. What are some of the personal benefits to you personally, of getting sober? of your recovery? Oh my gosh. There's so many. Serenity and peace and calmness mm -hmm. and not reacting out of fear and anger anymore. But, you know, my health, the health of my, my, my adult children are thriving, you know, in spite of being raised by me. <laughs> Um, I like myself today. Um, I never did before. I mean, for years, I, I hated who I was. I hated the sight of myself. And, Absolutely. you know, today I can honestly say, I love who I am. I love my life. It's not perfect, mm -hmm. but I have tools to deal with it when it's not so good. And for the most part, it's just, it's just wonderful. Even my own children have said to me repeatedly, you know, mom, you're not as reactive as you used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Life is good today. I'm blessed and thankful. Absolutely. I agree with all of that. I've experienced all of that myself. What would you say if you had to pick like the very best part of being sober, what would you say? And, and, I know it's hard because there's so many benefits, right? There's so many benefits. But if you had to like, if you were, you know, you had to just pick one, what would you say that one thing is? Peace. Peace. Oh, I'm at peace. Peace. And peace is power. Yeah. It's power in peace. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Love that. What's some advice that you would give to somebody who is in early recovery or still struggling, you know, wanting to get sober, but just struggling to really get it? What's, what's some advice you would give them? Oh, go to meetings and look for those similarities, connect with those similarities. Mm -hmm. That was my downfall, like I said. Mm -hmm. so. What advice would you give to family members of, um, somebody, you know, like a, a family member who has a loved one who's struggling with addiction, any advice that you would, you would give to them? Yeah. Um, the person that is struggling 
is has to want recovery for themselves no matter how much you love them it's and want it for them it won't happen um and so because of that um i would say detach with love and and take, take care of yourself mm -hmm. okay thank you and is there anything that i have haven't asked you or is there anything that you would like to share that you haven't shared that you think it's an important for somebody somebody to hear that might help somebody else recovery is a journey it, it's not a destination it's, it's a wonderful i'm gonna cry <laughs> it's a wonderful wonderful journey and um tears of joy though not tears of yeah tears of joy joy yeah yeah it's, it's it's definitely the best the best decision the best thing that i've ever done for myself the yeah. best thing ever and one more question and this is one <laughs> this is sort of my one that i like to throw in at the very end uh oh how how would you, Deb, like to be remembered? And what I mean by that is like, what would you like your legacy to be? Oh, wow. Um, well, my, my children are my legacy. Is that, what you're, is that what you're asking? How would you like to be remembered? Okay. Um, for the goodness. Mm -hmm. For the good. Um, I, yeah, that I'm, I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. um, I, oh gosh, I don't know. That's really hard. Um, that's, a, that's a good answer though. I mean, I, I think that, you know, to be remembered as being, as having goodness, you know, and being yeah. a good person is something that's really great to aspire to to consistently be and i know you weren't aware that i was going to ask this question <laughs> i just thought of something else yeah go ahead go um ahead. okay along those lines i think um you help me be able to um put into words what i was what i was um feeling i want my legacy i want my children to remember me as someone who always tried to do <laughs> her very best Mm -hmm. And when I knew better, I did better. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And that's absolutely true for all of us. When we know better, we do better. Yeah. So was, is there anything else that you want to share uh, before we, we wrap it up? Well, thank you. No. <laughs> thank you so much, Deb, for being here. Oh, my gosh. I just, I, I think that anything that we share, like this is our story. You know what I mean? This yeah. is our truth and your willingness to share that truth, you know, with the public and with so many people out there that are struggling with this disease and be able to give hope. Like I really like, I, I so appreciate you so very much because I'm somebody that believes in being living my recovery out loud and, you know, being somebody, being a beacon, you know, for other people that they, you know, that they know that there's places that they can go and people that they can talk to that they don't have to go through this alone. Nobody has to go through this alone and be by themselves. So namaste. You're very welcome. Thank you so much for being here.